Um, without much further ado, I'd like to start with a prayer uh, as usual when we begin our when we begin every meeting that we have, including this uh, discovery, Bible discovery, we start with a prayer. Let's uh, close our eyes and uh, invite the presence of the Lord amongst us, Let's invite the presence of the Spirit to breathe in the love that Christ has for all of us and breathe out that same love to be able to be shared with all the people around us. We come before the Lord tonight uh, in order to learn from Him through the many instruments that He will use. We pray, O oh Lord God, that You will be with us. We pray, Lord God, that You will send Your holy angels to keep this place a safe haven for all of us. We invoke the Holy Spirit as we say together, Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Heavenly Father, please um, pray for all of us that we may have an open heart and an open mind. We pray for our um, we pray for our uh, we pray for our teacher today, our mentor and our uh, uh, expert and our the one whom you will use as an instrument. We pray for him, O oh Lord God, that uh, you will give him uh, your blessings and give him the graces and give him the courage and the, uh, and the confidence that he needs in order to impart to us your words of wisdom, O oh Lord God. We pray, Lord, for all of those who are still on the way to join us. We pray that uh, they will always uh, be in your keeping and be in your protection. All this we ask in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Good evening. Um, before, before I start, um, before we start the proceeding, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to have a sharer here who will um, give us um, a little uh, target, a little discovery, a little uh, w some some small words in order to prime up, prime us up into what is about to happen, and I call upon my. Uh, leader, my chapter leader, Mike Pimentel, to give us his insight on this tonight. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Brother Marcy, and uh, a very cold evening to everyone. It's, um, it's so good to see a lot of uh, uh, participants tonight coming from uh, uh, Oceania. But of course, uh, our brothers and sisters here in Australia and somebody from the Philippines as well. Um, this this Bible discovery is something that uh, you know I think is uh, personally this personally um, this is something that we need. Like uh, for me personally, I think this is something that um, we I, I need to know about God's kingdom because we have been working for God's kingdom. But you know what's the meaning of that, and how does that relate to the Bible? That is something that. Um, uh, and I think Brother Marcy for, you know, for being able to find a subject matter expert to teach, to talk to us tonight. Um, the Bible is something, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's our, you know, it's, it's the focus of our mission. And to slowly, uh, to slowly learn more about the Bible, the in-depth about the Bible, interpretation and all, the, and all that. Sometimes we... We, we need somebody who can uh, who can really explain things to us in a deeper uh, in a deeper way and ju just reading the Bible it's you know sometimes we we cannot uh, we cannot really interpret it unless uh, of course we feel things we feel it we, we, we feel God's presence in our life when we read the Bible but 
if it is explained to us, I guess, you know, when we read the Bible the next time, we might be more, um, you know, everything will, uh, will be more, uh, you know, we will understand things better. And um, again, thank you, Brother Marcy, for organizing this because um, this is a, a, journey that, a journey that I think we, we all need to go after we, we you know, it's, it, it, we have, uh, Easter has just been uh, finished a few weeks ago. And it is a good time for all of us, uh, brothers and sisters, to, to really go into this journey of uh, Bible discovery. I hope that this will be the first of a series of talks, maybe, uh, so that we slowly uh, learn more uh, or a deeper, uh, a deeper understanding of the Bible. Uh, again, this is very important for me personally in my uh, faith journey, as well as my wife, Eileen. And I guess that that's, that's also true to, to all of us. Thank you. And I hope we, we, we listen with our hearts, not just with our minds tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Mike. As usual, he's always uh, mission ready, yeah? Now, let me introduce our speaker for today. Um, I, I, I got this uh, from uh, a 2017 uh, Renaissance for Marriage uh, blurb. <laughs> Peter and Susan Holmes, etc. He's, uh, he's an assistant, he's an associate dean uh, in uh, Notre Dame, in um, Notre Dame in uh, Sydney. And, um, you know, he's with the eight children. I don't know if that's still correct. I think that's still correct, right? <laughs> Peter was trained and served as a Lutheran minister before working in counseling, consulting, and teaching roles within the Catholic Archdiocese of Melbourne and Sydney. He spent more than six years as the manager of studies for Catholic adult education in Sydney. He, is lectured in, he has lectured in scripture, theology, and biblical languages, Hebrew and Greek. Peter's research interests include the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the relationship between faith and reason, and his present PhD resource research focuses on the theology of masculinity. I think I, I heard that in one of his podcasts, you know, about the masculinity. But we met, Susan and I met uh, Peter Holmes uh, in the Renaissance for Marriage. Once by we attended the Renaissance for Marriage, uh, sponsored by Copas for Christ. We were sponsored by Copas for Christ because we cannot afford the fee. <laughs> so we, we went there, but we, 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 we met these uh, beautiful people. And uh, in that sense of marriage, we were inspired. And that's why I asked them, you know, please help us, you know, in our journey as far as our uh, faith is concerned. Without much further, I'll give you now, Mr. our speaker for today, Peter Holmes. Just give them a big hand. Hello, Marcy. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Now, would you mind if I share a slide of my own to begin with here? So perhaps if I can yep. jump on. There I go. Okay. So good evening to you all. This is, um, I've actually had the very big privilege of speaking to Couples for Christ um, groups in Sydney uh, once live. And, and this is the second one online. And I'm very delighted every time I do because you, you firstly, you're all very keen uh, on the scriptures, which is my love and, and my lifelong study. Um, the very small correction to that um, blurb that you put of me, Marcy, is that I have actually handed in my PhD and I'm currently oh, yeah. praying and waiting for the markers to get back to me. So <laughs> okay. please join me in praying for that. Um, let me just so so today, um, Marcy and um, uh, the, the team asked me to speak on two subjects. Uh, one is, uh, is Christ divine? Is Jesus actually God? Um, and that, that comes up a, a fair bit in discussion with people who perhaps aren't Catholics, but even people who are Catholics sometimes are, seem a bit confused about that. Um, however, even if I, I think I will show you from the Bible that uh, the Bible says that he is, but my next question in the first hour will be, well, so what? Why does it matter that he's God? What, does, what difference does it make? What, how does it change the way we live? Uh, what does that mean for us in our daily life? 
And that's the kind of question I like to bring the Bible down to every time we talk about the Bible. What does it mean for our daily life? What does it mean when I brush my hair? What does it mean when I cross the road? What does it mean when I care about my family and love other people? So that the first um, part of this talk um, will be focused on Christ and whether the scriptures say that he is in fact God. And the second part, um, we're going to talk about God's kingdom. So if he is God and king, uh, then what does his kingdom look like? And, and Christ constantly talks about the kingdom of heaven in the gospel of Matthew. And he talks about the kingdom of God in the gospel of Luke and Mark. What does that mean? What does it, you know, when you talk about the kingdom of God, what does that even mean? And how do we participate in God's kingdom? What does that mean for us now? So that's they're the two topics we're looking at today. Okay. Just get my slideshow up and hopefully you will be able to see what we're talking about now. I don't want that. I want this. Now, can you see that slide? Good, good. All right. So Jesus Christ is Lord is a statement that the Christian faith says. And we, and I mean, it's clearly from scripture, but Jesus Christ being the Lord is a big statement because in um, scripture, the name Lord is used mostly and properly of God. In fact, when the, in the Hebrew scriptures, they try not to say God's name, the proper name of God. We, we know that now as Yahweh or Jehovah or however we've tried to butcher that name. Uh, we actually don't know how it's pronounced, by the way. We shouldn't be saying it too much because we don't know how it's supposed to be pronounced. Um, Pope Benedict's told us not to use it in liturgies or songs, so we're, we're supposed to be backing off on that. But when the Jews avoided saying that name, they would always substitute the name Lord for God's name. And so when you see Lord in the Old Testament, it almost always refers to God, the proper name of God. So instead of um, the name that we sometimes say as Yahweh, they would use the word Adonai, which means Lord. You've probably heard of Adonai in various songs, um, as praise songs, etc. But Adonai is the name that the Hebrews would use, and that translates into Greek as Kyrie. You might recognize Kyrie as something we say in the liturgy. We say, Lord have mercy, Kyrie eleison. The, um, the Lord part there refers directly to God's name. Um, to say Jesus Christ is Lord is a big claim. It means that we're saying Jesus Christ is God. He is the Lord, the one. So does this have, you know, is there any hints in the Old Testament? The first hint um, I'm going to point to tonight is in Isaiah. You probably recognize this particular text. It comes up around Christmas time. But for unto us a child is born to us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulders now that means the government being on his shoulders means the responsibility and power and authority of government meaning the kingship shall rest on him and his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty god so in isaiah already when he's predicting the future king who will come and uh make everything right for his people, he says he's, he will be called mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Now, sometimes we rattle these off and we forget that Isaiah is writing approximately um, seven to 800 years before Christ. So we're talking about someone who's writing, prophesying seven or 800 years ahead. Imagine if you tried that. It just I can't even predict what's happening tomorrow in the weather. But it's obviously inspired by God that um, this prophecy of Christ being not just a good man, not just a mag magnificent king, not just some sort of angelic beating, but mighty God. Okay. Do the scriptures teach that Jesus was in fact God? Well, in John 1.1, Right at the beginning of John's gospel, you, you, I mean, you know these texts well, I'm sure you've heard them read in mass. In the beginning was the word. That sounds like a weird way to start a verse. In fact, in the Greek, it says in beginning, not in the beginning, because it's deliberately imitating the start of Genesis. In the Hebrew in Genesis, it says in beginning 
God created heavens and earth. And this Greek formula in John's gospel is a direct imitation. It's almost copied word for word out of the Greek Old Testament. In the beginning was the word. And so in the place of the word God, he has put the word in John's gospel, making it very clear that the word is in fact supposed to be God in this. And the word was with God and the word was God. So in case we had any doubts, the word is definitely God in this account of John. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him. And without him was nothing was made that was made. In other words, Jesus, the word, was in fact involved in every part of creation as being part of God, as being a person in the Trinity of God. John has got no doubts whatsoever about what this is and what this means. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Just in case we imagine that this word is talking about some sort of angelic being that's out there. No. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. That means that Jesus is that eternal second person of the Trinity. That eternal word that was with God right at the beginning and was God has now become flesh in Jesus Christ. The man we know who walked on earth. Um, oops, go back one. And we have seen his glory. Uh, um, my picture there is covering that there, but we have seen his glory, the glory of the father. So he has actually revealed God, the father to us in himself. I just want to briefly touch on this because the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. You've probably heard that before. What you might not have heard is the word dwelt there is exactly the same word as when God dwelt in the temple, in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies. In fact, if we translated it correctly, it would say the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. It's talking about God's holy, awesome presence in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies. And then in, in John's gospel, he says the word became flesh. And here is how God is available to us now in his mercy and grace and power in Jesus Christ. All of the amazing things that God worked for Israel, all the miracles in, in Egypt, the miracle crossing the Red Sea, the miracles in terms of preserving Israel when they were faithful uh, to God from all around them um, and all the dangers. All of that was attributed to God's saving presence in the tabernacle. And now we have that saving presence in the word made flesh. Okay. Jesus himself tells us that he's God. That's a big hint. I would say, you know, <laughs> did Jesus, some people say, well, Jesus is a nice bloke. Um, he's an interesting man. I like some of what he says. Uh, it's just the church I don't like. Well, the trouble is with this. Um, you might have heard C.S. Lewis write about Jesus. C.S. Lewis wrote about Jesus that you can't just say he's a nice bloke. You can't just say everything's, you know, I like him. He's okay. I just don't like what other people have done with him because Jesus claimed to be God. Now, C.S. Lewis made the point that if Jesus claimed to be God, then he's either right and he is God or he's lying or he's a lunatic because if someone claims to be God and they're not, they're either lying or they're a lunatic. And so C.S. Lewis summed this up as saying, Jesus is either liar, lunatic or Lord. He's either telling us the truth about himself or he's completely nuts or he's the Lord. Now for someone completely nuts, he does a good job of covering it because <laughs> if he is completely nuts, he does some amazing miracles, including coming back from the dead. That's just the most amazing thing. In other words, he wasn't deluded. Everything he said came true. Everything he promised, he fulfilled. He even beat death. This is so he can't be liar. 
He's not a lunatic and therefore he is the Lord. But Jesus says some things. I've picked out only a few tonight because I don't want to spend, I want to give you time to reflect on these texts. But firstly, one of the most amazing ones um, is this one. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am, says Jesus. Now, the reason why this is so, so big is in the Old Testament, when Moses comes across um, God and God's revealing himself to Moses, Moses asks um, God to tell him his name. He says, what will I say your name is when I go to Israel? And he says, I am who I am. Tell the elders of Israel this. I am sent you. God names himself. I am. Now, when God, when Jesus himself says before Abraham was, I am, he's not saying I was before Abraham. He's not even saying I will be with Abraham in the future. He's saying I am. Their time does not limit Jesus. He is with Abraham at the same time as being in our future, judging us all in the eternity. He is the eternal one. Now, the Jews, in case we think, oh, that's just a bit, bit vague, the Jews knew exactly what Jesus was saying. They knew exactly what he was claiming because they tried to stone him to death straight away, which is the punishment for blasphemy. And they said, this man deserves to die because he claims to be God. They explicitly singled him out and tried to stone him to death because they knew that what he said meant that he was claiming to be God. That's why the Jews sought all the more to kill him in John 5. Not, be, not only because he broke the Sabbath, but because he called God his father, making himself equal with God. That's in John 5, 18. Um, by the way, Marcy, I've sent all of these slides to you on email. So if anyone wants to get them, you can get them from Marcy. Um, in case you're all frantically writing these references down, <laughs> I'll just save you some of the trouble. Jesus himself says in John 10, I and the father are one. Now, that's a big call. I've been married 26, uh, now my wife's going to tell me off, 26 and a half years. And I, even I wouldn't claim to be one with my wife. I'd say occasionally we get pretty close to being close together. <laughs> but to say you're one with someone means that you are unified in every possible way. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. We are not just one in our intentions. We're not just in agreement. We are the same. We are one, one being. That's huge. And the Jews did not misunderstand this. They were so angry with Jesus. Jesus tells us he's God. And when Philip says, show us the father, Jesus says, what? <laughs> we've been together so long. How can you say, show me the father? Whoever's seen me has seen the father, says Jesus. Because I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. In other words, the two of us are united in the Godhead. Jesus is making it very clear that he is, in fact, God. He's united with the Father in the Godhead. He makes this clear in terms of authority. So he's not just sort of a hanger on. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Matthew 28. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. These are the... Um, the big, the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. It's like saying, I am the A to Z, says the Lord. I am the one who was and who is to come. In other words, he's saying, I span all time. I am the beginning. I was here right at creation and I am the end. You will see me at the other end. There's no doubt about it. Jesus is directly saying that he is God. Even more potent, we've talked about Jesus and his father being one in the Godhead. Jesus, with the father, sends us the Holy Spirit. He promises us the Holy Spirit. He says, when the counselor comes, who I shall send to you with the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, bear witness to me. So Jesus and God 
and God the Father send the Spirit. And then we say this in the Creed, don't we? we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. This is the verses that these come from. We didn't just make this stuff up. It comes directly from Christ's own mouth. Now, beyond Jesus, the apostles themselves who had seen his glory, as John says, bore witness to Christ. They continued to say Jesus was, in fact, God. Now, this is the thing. Even if you suggested Jesus was just a little bit nutty, he was a good bloke, but a bit nutty, his disciples were also committed to this. Think about what they got if there was any gain in the disciples in following this, if it was a delusion, if it was wrong. None, do you, does anyone know how many of the disciples live to an old age? Just one, only John. All the rest were martyred. All of them rest died torturous and horrible deaths of martyrdom. Now they were all glorified because they were praising God for having the privilege of doing so, but they all died torturous deaths. There's no way that all of these human beings would have stuck to their guns and stuck to this unless it was the truth. Not just any old truth, but a truth they knew was much more important than their own life. This is the, the witness of the early church, the witness of those men who are right there, men and women who are right there with Christ and knew him. Now, as John says, we have seen his glory. This is right at the beginning, right after he said that Jesus is God. We have seen his glory, the glory as of the only son, the only son from the father. Now, Jesus, and at the end of his book, in the Gospel of John, he says, now, Jesus did many other things. He's trying to say, I couldn't fit them all in this book. But these, that is, the, the Gospel of John is written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you have life in his name. The purpose of John telling you this is not just to say, here's a really cool fact I'd like to tell you about. He's trying to say, I want you to believe this because this belief, this truth will give you life. And finally, when Thomas is confronted with Christ, we all know about doubting Thomas. He says, oh, I don't believe this stuff unless I see the wounds of Christ, unless I see the marks in his hand and put my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe. Jesus appears to Thomas and says, put your hand in my side. Put your fingers in the wounds in my hands. And Thomas responds with this answer, my Lord and my God. Now, he doesn't just say, oh, Jesus, you're back. That's cool. He says, my Lord and my God. By the way, this is the shortest prayer that I'm aware of, which we're taught to pray at the moment of consecration. Now, we might have other more complex prayers, but when the mode of consecration, when the priest raises the 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 host and the chalice, the, the beautiful words of St. Thomas, as we see Christ in the flesh risen and we say, my Lord and my God, very simple and profound prayer. We're praying with the apostle when we pray this, the one who's been taught to believe by Christ's own flesh and blood. Now, what's cool about the gospels is they also record that strangers and pagans also recognize Jesus as God. People in the boat, when the, the, the sea is calmed, it goes from being absolutely tumultuous. They all think they're going to drown and die. Suddenly, everything's calm. And the boat, those in the boat worship him and say, truly, you're the son of God. And when the centurions facing, uh, who stood facing him saw that Jesus breathed his life last, he says, truly, this man was the son of God. And in Matthew's gospel, when the centurion sees the earthquakes and all the events that happen around the, the crucifixion he says truly this was the son of god now i haven't put in here because i don't like quoting demons but there's also the case of when when jesus goes and throws out the de the demons out of all of the people across gennesaret and in all sorts of other places and they scream out you're the you're the son of god and he says shh stop stop telling people even the demons know. Now, James says this, by the way, later in the Bible. He says, if you say there is a God, well, don't be too, too proud of yourself because even the demons know there's a God, but they're scared of him. 
But right here in the gospel, we see that the demons, the pagans, the centurions, the people, even the people who put Jesus to death knew that he was God. Now, going into the New Testament, Paul teaches us that Jesus is God. Paul calls Christ our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, in Titus. He also says Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever in Romans. Now, there's no ambiguity here. He's not being fuzzy. Christ, who is God over all. And before he calls him our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Colossians, which is probably the most powerful uh, version of explaining this, he says he is the image or the icon of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him, all things were created in heaven on earth, visible and invisible. You might recognize that language because that's also in the creed. For in him, the whole fullness of the deity, deity is another word for Godhead, dwells bodily. So in all fullness, Paul is making it very clear that God, Jesus is God. Finally, in Corinthians 8, 6, Paul says, yet there is for us, sorry, yet for us, there is one God, the Father. Now notice the parallels here. He says, there's one God, the Father, from whom all things, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And then he says, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Exactly the same phrase. He talks about God exactly the same way as he talks about Christ because they are in fact united in the Godhead. It's very clear. The book of Hebrews teaches us that Jesus is God and particularly that Jesus is a unique uh, way in which God has revealed himself to us. Now, this is the first few verses, the first three verses of Hebrews. In many and various ways, God spoke to us of old, to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, now just think about that. We often think of ourselves as the last days. The book of Hebrews is written before the turn of the first century after Christ. So it's possibly 80, 90 AD. In these last days, he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he created the world, through whom he created the world. And he is the glory of God, bears the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe by his word of power. And when he had made purifications for sin, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Absolutely no doubt that the book of Hebrews claims Jesus is God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Sounds like a formula. It is because it's the same formula used of God. God is the same at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. He is constant in his being. Okay. So why is this important? As the book of Acts says very clearly, the reason why this is important is that there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name, and they're talking about Jesus here, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. In other words, the only way to know God is in Jesus. The only way to be saved by God is through Jesus. And the only way to live in God is in Christ, in Jesus. Now, Vatican, the Second Vatican Council acknowledged that there are some people who don't know Jesus explicitly. There are some people who've never heard Jesus preached they've never met him through someone's love they live in a, a remote area and we don't know what god's mercy is for them we just don't know and we trust that god is merciful to those who who have goodwill but we don't know but in terms of what we do know what we do know is that salvation is always going to come through christ even for those who don't know him yet 
Salvation is only known in Christ. And we must pin our hopes, pin our love, and join ourselves to God through Christ. So, still why is it important? There's one God, one mediator between us and God. The man, Jesus Christ. Specifically, Romans 10 says, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, remember what I said about Lord at the start? The Lord means God. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, the name of the Lord there is is huge. We'll come to that word name and, and which name we're talking about there in a second. The reason why we're confessing that Jesus is God. Well, I haven't written on any of the slides here, but basically it comes down to this. The church fathers examined this. They said, what if Jesus isn't God? Well, if I can put it in colloquial language, if Jesus isn't God, if he's just a good man, we're stuffed. Because a good man dying doesn't save us. It's not enough. Anyone dying wouldn't save me. They might save me from a bullet. They might save me from local death. But they can't save me from my sins. Only God can give that sacrifice. But on the other hand, if God isn't man, if Jesus isn't a man... We're also stuffed because as Augustine and St. Anselm both said, in order to save us, he had to take us on himself. He had to take on our humanity and take on the, the cost of our sin. He who knew no sin, says St. Paul, became sin for us. So God became man. Now, this is the most radical fact of the human of the christian faith and it's the thing that makes us different to everyone else it's also the reason why this this central fact is the most attacked one and the one that we have most doubt cast on us lots of other people believe in a in one god lots of other people believe in a a kind of a, a god who's out there and maybe you're even one who loves them sometimes but nobody would make this up that God has actually become a human person, taken on our flesh, taken on our sins and won the victory over death. Okay. So what does this mean for us? And Paul tells us in Philippians two, the fact that Jesus is God and yet took on human flesh sets the primary example for our Christian life. He says, This is Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Have this mind, this mindset, this way of thinking in yourselves or among yourselves. Sometimes that can be read as a community because it's plural. But he's also talking to you as a person. Have this mind in you, which was in Christ Jesus. In other words, take the mind of Christ. What's that mind? Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. Now that's a difficult word grasp uh, in, in the original Greek because it's hard to translate. It can mean wielded, um, exploited, um, used. Basically Jesus didn't say, I'm God. You can't mess with me. He was humble. He did not claim his rights as the son of God. I mean, imagine this, you're on the cross. He's imagine if it was one of me, if it was me or one of us, we would say, what? You can't do this to me. This is outrageous. Jesus did not claim his Godhood as an escape. He didn't deserve any of it. He didn't claim justice. He didn't claim anything. He didn't count equality with God as a thing to be wielded, but he emptied himself. He considered himself empty, taking the form of a slave. That's us being born in the likeness of man. The first and most huge humble act of God is to become a baby. 
And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Now, therefore, because of this, God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. And what's that name? The Lord. The Lord is above every name. So that at the name that Jesus has, every knee should bow and every tongue confess in heaven and on earth that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is that he is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, when we say that Jesus is God, we glorify God. When we say, when we recognize the Son, when we praise the Son, when we say Jesus is Lord, we make God glorified. We glorify God himself. Because he has told us to look to his Son. You think about what happened at the baptism of Christ. The voice comes out of heaven. This is my beloved son. What does he say? Listen to him. Why? Because he is going to take us back to the father. And by the way, if you ever get the temptation to believe that your Holy Spirit is talking to you, here's how we know. The Holy Spirit always points to Jesus. And that Jesus always takes us to, to God the father. The Trinity will always point us to Jesus because Jesus leads us back to the Trinity. Jesus is the way we know God. Jesus is the way we have access to God. Jesus is our savior who will draw us into the Trinity. When we, and this is the absolutely mind blowing part of Christianity. We are not just going to heaven to hang out in the little, you know, in the corridor somewhere or have a little room on our own. St. Paul makes this clear. We are going to heaven in the son we are baptized into the name of christ jesus we are heirs of the father in christ jesus that means when we get to heaven our spot in heaven is in christ we are in the trinity and that's why jesus says when you get there you'll be ruling angels because you'll be on the throne with me we are sons of God. And I don't mean that in a masculine sense. I mean, when we are baptized into Christ, we are baptized into Jesus. And in Jesus, in heaven, we are part of God himself. The Eastern Church, when they talk about this, call this theosis, which means becoming God. Now, we talk about it as being sanctification, that we are being made holy gradually through our life. And as we come into, um, if we die before God has finished making us holy, we have God mercifully still takes us to purgatory and purifies us from what is left to be purified and then draws us to heaven. And that, that process draws us into Christ. And as St. Paul says, Christ then presents us spotless and pure to the father so i've gone a little faster than i thought i might have and so i've got some questions for this first section i've got plenty of time to discuss it marcy will have to tell you what time you've got and what times we meet etc but i want to leave you with these to discuss and think about even if you're just by yourself just think about this as a follower of christ this one who is God. Jesus Christ says, follow me. It's the first thing he says to his disciples. And it's the same thing he says to you. Follow me. What does this mean? What does it mean today? Not in some future thing, not in some big plan you make in the future. Now, of course, we need to make plans. But what does it mean right now? What does it mean when I set my alarm to get up tomorrow morning? What does it mean when I Look to my past. And what does it mean when I plan for my future? If Christ is the king, if he is God, where do I fit in his kingdom? Just a little bit of a word of warning. I'm going to ask these questions again after the second part. The exact same questions. 
when we've talked all about God's kingdom. But right now, I just want to talk about Christ being God and king. And what are these questions? Where do they leave us? I'll shut up now, Marcy. It's over to you. Thank you very much for that, Peter, and, uh, and uh, for that sharing, for that uh, teaching that you have. Uh, I, I remind everyone, if you have questions, um, please uh, put them in the, in the chat uh, screen so I can uh, relay that to all of you or to Peter. Um, you know, I, I have a question, Peter. Why, why is it that uh, in most of the passages of the divinity of Jesus, it's always expressed in John, but hardly any mention on the other three evangelists? It's a good question, Marcia. And uh, as you've noticed, a lot of my quotes there are from, um, yes. uh, are from that. Um, I think that I'm trying to give you the, the shortest possible answer because I'm a biblical scholar. I'd like to tell you the whole story, but I'm not going to. <laughs> okay. It depends on the purpose of the gospel. The, the Jews already believed the Messiah was coming, right? And Matthew's job, Matthew's gospel, is trying to convince the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. And so he doesn't have to convince them about the nature of the Messiah. He doesn't have to tell them what the Messiah is. He doesn't have to go. All he has to do is tell them Jesus is the Messiah, and it kind of fits into their model that they already understand. He does carefully readjust the way they think about Jesus as a Messiah, which we're going to talk about in the next hour, because they think his kingdom is going to be one that, you know, they, they get to rule the world and they get to be the high head honchos. And he has to adjust that idea, but he doesn't have to prove the Messiah is coming from God because they already believe that all he has to prove is that Jesus is, is the Messiah. Um, Mark's gospel uh, he's deliberately writing as a mystery, a fast paced mystery story. And if you read Mark's gospel, you realize he doesn't even tell you that Jesus, you know, he doesn't tell you much about Jesus at all. In fact, the whole of the way through Mark's gospel, you're rushed through all these really big events and you don't get hints. Like you don't hear about the temptation in the wilderness. For example, you only hear he went there. You don't hear what happened. And you don't get details about Jesus divinity. You just get something happens and everyone goes, Whoa, who is this guy? And then they rush on to the next story. And most of the time in the gospel of Mark, the disciples are going, what? Hey, what? Hey, what's happening? And, and it's all very confusing. And it's deliberately done to, in a sense, it's St. Peter because Mark was St. Peter's secretary and, and translator. And so he wrote down all of St. Peter's homilies. And that's what the gospel of Mark is. But what, what Mark's giving us is St. Peter's own perspective. Because it's clear from the gospel, St. Peter didn't understand what was going on. <laughs> I mean, he loved Christ, but he didn't understand what was going on until afterwards, until the end. Uh, so Mark's gospel is quite deliberately like a mystery novel. And if you read it, it doesn't even, it doesn't really solve the mystery at the end. It kind of just leaves you hanging because it's a deliberate thing to try and entice you to ask the question, well, what happened next? And uh, a Christian would say, well, let me tell you what happened next, because the answer is, of course, the church and, and so on. Luke's gospel is a little bit different. And there are references to in Luke's gospel to Christ's divinity. But Luke is someone who's a Gentile. He's never heard the Jewish stuff before. And while Matthew and Mark, they are very familiar with God's law in the Old Testament. They know that God cares about women. They know that God cares about the poor. They know that God cares about the sick because that's been all the way through the Old Testament. Luke has just read this stuff and he's heard from Jesus and through, through Paul and others uh, about this. And he's so excited about it, he has to tell you. And so he spends the whole Gospel of Luke explaining this amazing new teaching that Christ cares about the sick, that he cares about women, that he cares about the poor, that he, he wants to save everyone, not just Jews, but everyone. And his focus is that focus. John, the reason why John focuses so heavily on the divinity of Christ is mainly that he wrote 30 years after the others. 
Mm. So they've all, all of the apostles are dead by the time John writes his gospel. And by this stage, they've already, some people in the Christian church have already begun to misunderstand the gospels. And there are, there's a, a crazy little group of people called the Gnostics who are trying to twist the gospel to say that Jesus wasn't really God. Now in Matthew's time and in Luke's time, these people weren't really there. There wasn't that question. It wasn't, everyone believed he was God. There was no question of it. But by the time you get to John's gospel, there were quite serious uh, heresies going around saying Jesus wasn't God. And so John has quite deliberately addressed those those errors in his work. And, and you'll notice that John doesn't just talk about Jesus being God. He talks a lot about the flesh because the same people who denied God as denied Jesus was God were trying to say that the flesh is bad, that your flesh is bad and you need to get rid of your flesh and ignore it and just focus on spiritual things, which sounds kind of Christian, but it's not. And John was emphasizing all the way through his gospel. Not only was Jesus God, but God became flesh. Now what that means is that you're not to reject your body because Christ has redeemed your body. Christ loves every single part of your body and he's going to glorify your body in the resurrection. It's an incredibly important message. John has a different focus for those reasons historically, but also of course the Holy spirit knew that we would have these questions and each one of the gospels addresses a different angle, a different set of questions. So Thank you very much for that. I think 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome back, friends and relatives. Thank you for, uh, thank you for your, your uh, thank you for being with us and uh, sharing with us all of these things. Now we come we we're back to our subject matter expert, Mr. For Peter Holmes, uh, maybe uh, to go on to the next session, uh, to the next session of our um, the our topic for today, the meaning of the kingdom of God. We always pray this, no? Uh, in the our Father, Thy kingdom come. What does that mean, Thy kingdom come? Does that mean I'm going to heaven or let's all die now, etc.? But no, I leave it to our subject matter expert, Mr. Peter Holmes. Take it away, sir. Thank you. And with your permission, I'll I'll throw the slide up again. So there we are. So thy kingdom come, as Marcy has pointed out, is we pray this. I mean, if you're anything, most Catholic families would pray this several times a day. If you're if, in a rosary, it happens at the end of every decade. We kind of rattle it off. We, we, I'd like to challenge us to think more deeply about it at the end of this talk, because this thy kingdom come, you're, you're committing yourself to something pretty big when we talk about God's kingdom. So let's talk about what that kingdom means. Firstly, we've just had um, a, an, a slight um, focus on Christ's divinity, which makes him the king of the universe. And what does his kingdom then mean? What does it mean to say your kingdom come God? And I must admit, I mean, for those of you who don't know, I was raised an evangelical, so a very low church evangelical. Uh, we thought Catholics were all going to hell. Um, um, you only think I'm joking about that, but no, we thought they were going, they were all going to hell. And um, I, uh, um, but just before my father died, he finally admitted that I might still be going to heaven in spite of the fact I'm a Catholic now. So <laughs> it's kind of we were taught this, but even as an evangelical, we thought thy kingdom come was talking about heaven and just heaven because it, when you look around us, I mean, look around the world today, it doesn't look like God's ruling, does it? In some ways, we just heard about Myanmar and the, the tragic situation that's ongoing there. The whole world is in chaos with, with COVID. We're very, very lucky here in Australia that, that we've been sheltered from most of that, but it's still crazy. It's still craziness. Um, 
it doesn't look like to our view that God is actually ruling, that God's in charge. And so we, we tempted to look forward as if the kingdom is all about the future, about some, some future event. But actually, I hope to challenge that and, and talk to you more about God's kingdom from the scriptures again. Okay, so the kingdom of heaven in the scriptures, I just went through the different references to the kingdom of heaven in the, in the gospels. And I would ask just to, to bear with me as I'm, I'm kind of having to rush through this because of our time frame. But the first thing, the first way the kingdom of heaven is mentioned is that John the Baptist says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And Jesus, when he begins his ministry begins with this, the same formula, repent for the kingdom of heaven is close to you. We have to look briefly at repentance because it seems as if repentance is the way we prepare ourselves for the kingdom. Jesus himself says to us, are you ready for the kingdom? Here's how you get ready. Repent. Now, what does this mean? In the Bible, in, in Greek, there are two different words for repent and they are used in the new testament interchangeably one of them i'm going to just refer to the words don't you don't not going to get tested on this don't worry about it i'm just telling you the words out loud so that you know which one i'm talking about but one of them is metanoia which means change of mind and not just i changed my mind i, I wanted fries no no i don't want fries to your whole mindset, your whole way of thinking to change and go in a different direction. The other word in the Bible, in Greek, that refers to repentance is epistrepho, which means to turn around on the spot and go the other way. Both of them mean to change direction to change direction of our thoughts and of our feet, our, our walk. Uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, to walk means to live. Uh, to walk is you, refers to your daily life with God. Each step you take, I mean, the, the, the Jewish people talked about the halakha, the walk with God. And what they meant was that each step you take is part of your life with God. And so... What does life with God look like? Well, it looks like a walk. I take this step with God. I take this step with God. And repentance then is described as turning my direction to God and walking that way. And metanoia talks about turning my mind to God and thinking that way. To prepare ourselves for the kingdom we need to repent. Now, repentance isn't about making us feel guilty. The focus is to change our direction to Christ. The first step to prepare ourselves for the kingdom is to change our direction to face Christ, to follow Christ. Now, that implies, of course, that we were facing another direction to start with. And we are, just like the apostles. Now, they weren't bad directions. Fishing isn't a bad thing. But Peter and Andrew are called to follow, to change their direction. Not because fishing was evil, but because the Jesus is their destiny, is their purpose, is their salvation. Repentance means to change our focus, our thoughts and our actions and our walk to follow Jesus. It might look the same tomorrow when I go to work, or go to church or whatever I do, but the change happens in our orientation, our disposition. The second thing about the kingdom, and this comes up in Matthew 5 when Jesus talks on the Sermon on the Mount, the kingdom belongs to the poor and to the persecuted. He talks about lots of other things. He's blessed are these, you know, blessed are those, blessed are the meek and all these things. But the two that talk about the kingdom of heaven are 
the poor, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the second, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The poor and the persecuted. This wouldn't make a great advertisement, by the way, if they played this at the, one of the big sporting events. Come to Christianity, you'll be poor and persecuted. <laughs> it doesn't sell well to the modern world. But what it says is God's kingdom is with the poor and the persecuted. And that is where the church's greatest missions have always been. Among those people who are most vulnerable, who are most persecuted, who are most unloved by others and in some ways seem to be unlovable. And that's what makes Christ's love when it's expressed through him or through us on his behalf. So remarkable. The kingdom of heaven comes first to the poor. When we talk about this in Catholic social teaching as being the preferential option for the poor. The church prefers first to come to those lost, to those poor, to the sinners, like, like in Luke's gospel, to the sinners, to the lost, to the sick. When the church first went to Africa to be missionaries, what did they do? They built hospitals and they built schools. They brought what was to help people flourish, to help them in their health and help them in their development um, of their country. The next point I want to make is that in Matthew's gospel and in the others too, but Matthew explicitly, the kingdom of heaven is open to all. Now, Matthew makes this point because some of the Jews had been tempted to think of God thinks of us as his special children. Therefore, no one else gets God. And God hadn't chosen them for that reason. God had chosen the Israelites so they could witness to his love to the whole of the nations. God's kingdom is open to all, even if not everyone will come. In fact, Jesus even says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. I don't know if you've noticed, but the politicians around the world, not so much in Australia, because it's un... un um, popular in Australia to be religious, but in some other countries, there's lots of people claiming to be religious, lots of politicians. And they say, Oh, I believe in God. And I think God says this. And often they make big claims and they claim God's on their side. God, Jesus warns us that not everyone who claims to be on God's side is on God's side. How will we know the difference? It says by their fruits, by the way they walk whether their minds are lined up with Christ. The kingdom is open to all. So that's a warning to us too, that if we happen to be in the church now, we are not here for our own privilege. We have a very deep and um, serious responsibility. The grace God has given us, is something given to us so that we can invite others to God's grace. The grace God has given us and the love he has given us is given to us so that we can reach out to others and love them and draw them to Christ's love. If we sit on our laurels and go, this is pretty cool being a Christian. I like being loved. I'll just sit here and be loved. In a sense, we've been miserly because we've given, been given the greatest gift and we haven't shared it. It's like sitting, you're in a big room when everyone's hungry and you get the packet of Tim Tams and you just sit on it and say, I'm really happy to have all my Tim Tams. You guys can all go jump. <laughs> you, you, of course, you want to share this beautiful thing. Well, not that Tim Tams are the best example of anything. I'm just using a trivial example. Now, Perhaps the last point here is perhaps the most scary one, but also the one that's most neglected. The kingdom of heaven is for those who keep, teach and keep the commandments. Jesus never intended any of the God's commandments to go missing. 
He intended to fulfill them. In fact, he says, not one stroke of a pen will disappear from the law. I have come to fulfill it. Everything in the Old Testament is subsumed and fulfilled in Christ. And so we study the Old Testament to understand what Christ has done in his ministry and his kingdom. And I'm going to talk about that when we get to a bit later. Let's have a look at some of the parables in Matthew's gospel where he unpacks the kingdom. Now, if you're following this, if you want to look this up later, this series of parables starts at Matthew's gospel, chapter 13. I haven't written that on the slide, sorry, but Matthew's gospel, chapter 13 the parable of the sower, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of, um, i am actually missed one there. I'll come back to it because I want to include them all. Each one of these parables gives us a kind of a picture of an understanding of Christ's kingdom. And he's telling his disciples because he knows what us, us human beings are like. When we get a kingdom, we start to build walls around it. We start to say, no, you can't come in. I don't like you. I prefer more of you. Um, we do all kinds of things, and Jesus is telling us what his kingdom is like. So, in a sense, all of these parables are little stories Jesus told to try and help us understand what he means by the kingdom. So, here's the first one. You know these stories, I'm sure. But the parable of the sower, you know the one where the sower throws his seed, some of it falls on the pathway, some of it falls on the rich land, some of it falls on the weeds, and some of it falls on the rocky ground. Now, we all think of this parable and we go, oh, yes, of course, that the grows up really well there, doesn't grow up so well elsewhere. If you're in a farming community, I grew up on a farm, right? If you're in a farming community. At least we've organized that one. Yeah. Could you check that up? If you're in a farming community, oh, sorry, farming community, the first question that comes to mind. <clears throat> sorry. Um, Gerald, you're, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> In the farming community, you're asking the question, what is, G what is the sower doing throwing seeds where he knows nothing's going to grow? Why is he throwing it among weeds? That's just silly. And part of the thing that Jesus is telling us uh, about the sower is he's teaching us about the generosity of God that Jesus and God have put the gospel into everywhere, even those hearts who are hard, so hard they'll never receive it. Jesus is so generous that he gives that opportunity. He still plants his gospel in every heart. He still puts it out there generously. And so in doing that, he teaches us to mirror his generosity. It is not for us to decide who is worthy of the gospel. Jesus himself, who knows men's hearts, still doesn't stop giving it to them. The second thing about the parable of the sower that I'd like to challenge you with is that often I've heard people preach on this. And when they teach or preach on this gospel, they try and say there are some people with hearts who are prepared for Christ. And there are some people whose hearts are stifled by weeds. And there are some people perhaps think of it slightly differently today. Christ plants the gospel in your heart in so many different ways. You receive so much grace from Christ all the time. He's giving you grace in the mass tomorrow. He's giving you grace in your life, in your prayers, in all kinds of ways for your family, for all your community. In all ways, Christ plants seeds of grace in your life. Those parts of your life which have been properly prepared for grace will grow. And those parts where you are hardened and against God's action will not grow. This parable is a kind of a, Basically, you, you are like all of those grounds. And the challenge to us is to prepare ourselves to be fruitful ground all over, not just in one place, not just in some places. The main thing there is, though, is God's generosity, God's complete generosity. The next parable, which I've missed here, is the parable of the weeds. I've missed on the screen, but I'm going to put it in anyway. The parable of the weeds. And that is... The owner of the property sows seed, 
it grows up, but someone, some naughty person, has sown bad seeds in the church. Now, we, uh, you don't have to be a genius. You'd only have to look at the news over the last 20 years to know that there are some bad seeds been sown in the Catholic Church, yes? There were some bad people who did some bad things, and they're still possibly doing them. And yet, notice the the owner, the landowner, who's, what he says is, no, we're not going to pull up all the weeds because we might accidentally pull up some real wheat. We will wait until harvest, when the fruit comes to bear, and then we will burn the tares and we will keep the wheat. Even Christ is not prepared to make judgment in his own church until all the fruit has come to, to bear. It shows us the patience of God waiting for his kingdom to come. The next parable is the parable of the mustard seed. This one is perhaps one of the more hopeful ones. I don't know if any of you have seen a mustard seed, but it's a teeny, 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 tiny little seed. It's like a speck in your hand. And yet it grows into a huge tree. And Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. And we go, okay, he means a little bit of faith, does a lot of things. Yes, but more, more. How many times do we look at the world and its problems? How many times do we look at the problems in the church even and feel overwhelmed by them? I can't fix this, we think. And Satan whispers in our ear, you're right, it's not worth it. Stop trying, give up. But Jesus says, firstly, you don't have to fix it because I'm the Messiah. You're, you're following me, remember? <laughs> when we try and save the world, we're actually trying to be Christ. And that's not, that's not our job. Christ is Christ. The second thing is, though, is that even the smallest thing, which we don't think is very big, even the smallest act of faith, even the smallest contribution to God's kingdom can grow into something magnificent. We should never doubt what Christ's grace can do with our tiny efforts. I'll never get to tell the dear old lady who all she did was smile and welcome me to a church once. And I was right on the edge of leaving and giving up on God. And all she did was smile and welcome me. I'll never get to tell her how much she changed my life and therefore my wife's life and the, my children's lives and everybody who comes after this because she died about two, three months after that. She knows now, of course, where she is, but I never got to tell her the small seed that she sowed. She could never have guessed what fruit that would bring. You never know how God's grace will work. The yeast is another parable on, along the same lines. A little tiny bit of yeast changes the whole loaf. The whole loaf isn't yeast, just that little tiny bit. And it changes everything. Jesus also, outside of these parables, talks about us being salt and light. In my room here, there's one little tiny point of light. And it changes the whole room. If you cook, you know that a tiny bit of salt changes the whole dish. Jesus isn't expecting us to dominate the world, to all be there, but he says a little sprinkling of you, just a little sprinkling of Christians can make things better. In the ancient world, they had no preservatives either. And so salt kept the food good. It preserved it from decay. It also made it taste better. So what Jesus was saying is that a little sprinkling of Christians in any country, in any community, in any town, preserves it from the decay that happens without them. And it makes the whole town taste better. It's a better place to be. It's a more wonderful place to be in the world. And it shows beyond proportion of the tiny little amount of salt, it changes the whole place. It changes the whole dish. It changes the whole thing and it preserves it for much longer.
The next two parables, the treasure and the merchant, are on the same message. One of them is a man finds a treasure and he sells everything he has and goes to the field and buys it. And the second one is the merchant who finds this pearl, which is of great price. He sells everything he has and buys the pearl. What, what are these parables and how they relate to the kingdom? Basically, the kingdom of God is everything. We only truly understand the kingdom of God when we're prepared, like the merchant, to give everything else for it. Now, that doesn't mean that everything else you have is evil. The stuff the merchant had, the stuff the farmer had were absolutely good things, but they were prepared to give them all up for the kingdom. Now, just in case someone misunderstands me here, that doesn't mean I need to go and sell my car and give it to the kingdom, whatever that is. It means I need to be prepared to give my car for the kingdom. Now, that means tomorrow my car is given to the kingdom, driving people to mass. My car is God's. My driver's license is God's. My time is God's. And so I give it all to the kingdom. Well, as soon as my car becomes more important than the kingdom, danger, danger. The pearl of great price we give everything for. There's nothing wrong with owning things because they give you the capacity to do good for God. But those things are God's and we must give them to God in our actions, in the use, in our generosity, in the way we use them to help and praise God. Finally, the last parable there is the net of fish. Once again, Jesus is giving us a warning about not, not being selective. And this one is a really tricky one, especially in Australia where our different groups of Christians tend to hang out with their own group. They tend to hang out with their own group and go, we're really comfortable here. We're going to just stay here. Christ net. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a net where you throw it down and the fishermen bring in all kinds of fish. We're up to um, chapter 13, verse 47 now. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down in a lake and caught all kinds of fish. And when it's full, the fishermen pull it to the shore and they throw away the bad fish and they keep the good ones. Two parts of that. A huge range of different varieties of fish. Almost every time when I was a young man, I've been involved in ministry most of my life, but every time I put on a program... And I had a big thing and I tried to attract people and I put out advertisements and everything. The kind of people who showed up made me a little bit scared. I thought, no, I was kind of hoping for a different, I didn't realize it, but I had a certain kind of person in mind because I feel more comfortable talking to certain types of people. <laughs> I feel like I know the words. I know how to talk to them. Um, if they like the Aussie rules football, I've got even more to talk about with them because I share that passion with them. But actually, I almost never get to talk to these people because God keeps challenging me to say, here's, here's my fish. Here, these are the fish that the net has caught today. These are the fish that I told you to caught, catch. The kingdom of heaven is all kinds of weirdness, all kinds of difference, all kinds of people, and we have to be ready for that. And luckily, it is weird because if it wasn't for weird people, I wouldn't be here. God's net is broad and wide and we should be rejoicing when someone quite different from us is brought in and let God do the sorting out on the shore. These parables are just to try and focus us. Christ trying to focus us on the attitude. So the attitude is God is generous. God sows his seed liberally and beautifully and constantly with his love, even when he knows people are going to reject him. And we should avoid writing people off in our own hearts. Isn't it easier when we think someone's hardened their hearts to God, we go, oh, it's just not worth it anymore. God's love says, no, the kingdom of heaven keeps throwing that seed on the path. Maybe, maybe one day it will come. The mustard seed says even the tiniest seed that lands could grow into the biggest fruit and you'll never know it. It takes a long time. The yeast changes the whole loaf and it's always worth throwing everything at the kingdom the treasure and the merchant who brings everything for that pearl of great price and the net is cast broad and wide so 
the biggest text on the kingdom of heaven is where we find out who's got the keys. Christ says to Peter, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Okay, now we find out where, what the door is. He says, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. These keys are the key to unlocking the kingdom. Now, the binding and loosing we know from John's gospel refers to the binding and loosing of sins, of of also doctrines and stuff like that, but basically the power of the keys to unbind things. The power of God given in his kingdom through humans, through, well, us in the church, but through specific humans in terms of certain types of unloosing is to forgive is to release prisoners from the shackles of their sin, to change their life into one that is glorifying God, to show them that they are loved, that in spite of what they think of themselves and the evil that's happened, God can save them, can change them, can redeem them. Now, what's cool about this passage is straight after sorry, straight before he's given the keys, Peter is told the gates of hell will not prevail against this kingdom. The gates of hell will not prevail against God's kingdom. And what's the kingdom? Forgiveness. Firstly, Peter has just confessed that Jesus is the Christ. We've already dealt with that in the first hour today. Jesus is the Christ, the son of a living God. Great. This is the rock on which Christ's church is built. I give you the keys of the kingdom, whatever you bind and loose, etc. Now, how will the gates of hell not prevail? Now, most of us read this and think, what, what Jesus is talking about here is that Satan will never beat the church. He'll never beat us down. We can hide in the church and the, the hell will not come and get us. But you think about it. It's the gates of hell. If hell wants to attack us, they don't bring their gates. Right? This story is hell on the defensive. This story is the church walking down to the gates of hell and kicking them in. The gates of hell will not stand up. What are they not going to stand up against? Forgiveness, because the only thing between us and God is our own stubbornness and sin. And when forgiveness is brought into someone's life, it is kicked down the door and they are now able to walk out of hell into heaven. And I'm using this metaphorically, of course, I'm not talking about after death. I'm saying when we are separated from God from our, by our own sin, forgiveness can break that down and bring us back to the relationship we're supposed to have with God. Basically, God has chosen to rule his people by forgiving them and calling them to live his love. This isn't new either. Back in Leviticus, one of those books that we're all scared of because it's got all those weird things with goats and cows and things and slicing them up and sacrifices. The whole book is about how the people of Israel get God's forgiveness. A whole other class, we'll do that some other time, but I can tell you that the liturgy of the Mass comes directly from Leviticus. The way God's sacrifices forgive the people of Israel is now played out in the liturgy of the Mass, how Christ's sacrifice forgives us and draws us into the Father's love. All of God's kingdom begins with repentance and forgiveness. We prepare ourselves for the kingdom by changing direction, coming back to the Father, and Christ forgives us and leads us to love. So, one of the things about the, the Lord's Prayer, you may have noticed, we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, how? On earth 
as it is in heaven. How is God's will done in heaven? Perfectly. No one's stopping him in heaven. How is God's will done in heaven? God is absolutely ruling in heaven. He's absolutely controlled. We say there's no more tears, no more crying, no more suffering in heaven. It's all God's blessed, flourishing everything. So when we pray this prayer, we're not just saying sometime in the future, God, we'd like you to have a kingdom. We say your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? On earth. Here. Now. How? Not a little bit, not a tiny bit, not like a little taste. No, as it is in heaven. We are praying for God to bring his rule of complete communion with him, of love, of unity, and of perfect um, sinlessness here to earth. The only way that happens is through his mercy. How do we bring heaven to earth? Firstly, the mercy of God. Mercy is a word which means we don't deserve it. None of us deserve God's love. We have done nothing to deserve it. In fact, we've done several things to not deserve it. The mercy of God is the beginning of our relationship. And this is why, by the way, the mass, the very start of the mass, we say Kyrie eleison, which means Lord have mercy. Christe eleison, Christ have mercy. And do you know this cry is not an uncommon one. That cry you would have heard in every street of every town where Jesus walked. Why? Because it was the cry of every beggar on the street. Sir, please help me. The cry of the beggar asking for someone to just give them something that they didn't work for, they didn't earn, they just need to live. We enter mass with that cry, asking for the mercy of God, not as people who deserve it. I've done pretty well this week, God. I reckon you owe me some grace. No, we say, Lord, have mercy. Notice what we sing directly after that. Glory to God. That's because we've had an answer in between. Glory to God in the highest meaning. Hooray, God has had mercy. The love of God brings heaven to earth. The power of God brings heaven to earth. And the presence of God brings heaven to earth. The power of God is expressed firstly and foremost through his sacraments his sacramental grace, which transform our lives. And I'm not just talking one off here. You're baptized. That's not just one off. What do you do as you walk into a church well, before COVID? Anyway, we reached out and we touch water. What's the water? It's the water of our baptism. When we cross ourselves, we are reclaiming our baptismal. We are reclaiming our baptismal birth into Christ. We are saying, I am baptized in the Son. I come as a Son of God before the Father. The power of God to change us in a way we couldn't change ourselves. There are lots of people who feel hopeless. I speak to many people about the Christian faith who aren't Christians because I'm in a university and about nine out of ten of them aren't Christians. And they all like the idea of love, but they don't believe it's possible. They might believe that they could love a bit, a bit, but most of them don't believe that they could be loved. How sad is that? And almost the only way to convince them is to actually love them. Not in a way that I get something from it, but in a way they know it's not for gain. 
It's just because they are loved by God. I've had so many students say to me, why are you bothering with me? Now, these are very, very attractive, very talented, very dynamic people. You would think they're going to be the future leaders of the country and they can't even believe that anyone loves them. Sometimes it's because their parents haven't loved them or they've abandoned them or they just don't feel in their society that anyone cares. But the power of God and the love of God has not that it doesn't have a way into them because they don't understand love. And the only way they'll know is if we show them. Lastly, come back to John at the very start of our session. The first session, we said the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We should never underestimate the power of God's presence. God says, Jesus says, where two or three of you are gathered, there I am in the middle. Now, given that we've got Burma and Vanuatu and all sorts of places represented here, I don't know where the middle is. Um, if we, <laughs> two or three are gathered, but wherever two or three are gathered, Christ is there. Christ is present, and He is present in you through your baptismal grace and through the grace of your confirmation and the grace of your the Eucharist that you receive and the grace of that reading the scriptures and the grace of prayers, he's present in you. Never ever feel like you are the Messiah because you're not. You're, you are living within Christ and bringing Christ to people. You're not the one doing the work. Christ is. Take hope in that, but also great confidence. Offer up what feeble efforts we can do and give them to Christ and he will transform them, change them. Lastly, the presence of God is most powerful where he has promised to be present, specifically in the Eucharist. Never underestimate that Eucharistic prayer, in the prayer in front of the Eucharist, the reception of the Eucharist, but also adoration. I was speaking to a, a good friend of mine who was profoundly depressed and didn't know where his life was going, and he said, I don't know what the solution is. And after we talked for a, an hour, he said, I don't know what the solution is, but what I'm going to do is pray in front of the blessed sacrament for an hour each day until I find a solution. And I came back to him a few months later and said, how did you go? How did, how did, what's the answer? He said, Oh, I found the answer. I said, well, what was it? And he said, you know how I said I was going to pray in front of the blessed sacrament an hour a day to find the answer. And I said, yes. And he said, well, the answer was to pray in front of the blessed sacrament once one hour a day. It changed everything. The presence of God, placing myself in God's presence and allowing him to change me. Just being in God's presence made him realize who he was, why he was, and how loved he was. And it's changed the entire equation. God's kingdom is a kingdom of love. It's not just a, a contemplation of how well off we are. Christ himself says, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Uh, I just want to focus on those last words, one another. It's easy for us to see why it's important to love someone who's down and out, the bum who's just come into church, or the hard, you know, the, the single mum who needs some help. What's really hard to love is the really annoying person who sits next to me in mass every week. Or the person who's in my, my group of friends who's constantly annoying. The people who are hardest to love are the ones right next to us. However, even if you're really good at convincing people to come to church, if they come to your community, if they come to your group, and you guys can't get along, they're not going to believe you about Christ's love. Christ says, here is how people will know that you belong to me. If you give self-sacrificing love to each other. Not easy stuff, not hugs. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with hugs. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I just meant not, it's not all lovey dovey and it's not all wonderful. And we all get along. Actually, you prove love when people are difficult. You prove love when people are just downright annoying. 
my wife demonstrates how much she loves me when I'm the grumpiest. Because there's no reason she should love me in that state. I should be given a slap over the back of the head. And yet she loves me. And it shows me what real love is. I haven't put this text in there. But it shows God's love. This, oh, there it is. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. St. Paul in another place says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we loved him, not when we said, oh, sorry, God, we want to come back to you. While we were still sinning, while we were still rejecting him, Christ said, I love you enough to die. Love is not that we love God, but that he loved us. And therefore, because he loved us, we love each other. Because if Christ thought you were worth dying for, I should at least think you're worth sharing a Tim Tam. <laughs> I'm sorry about the Tim Tams. They're just stuck in my head at the moment. Now, finally, and I know I'm getting close to time here, so I want to wrap this up quickly. Some people get confused about what love is. In fact, probably a large part of the problem in the church right now is that some people have been really confused about love. They've thought about love in a perverse way as if it's all about romance or sex or something like that. John's in his gospels and in his letters makes it really, really, really clear. And that's the last quote there. This is love that we follow his commandments. Which commandments? The ones he gave us right at the beginning. If you're confused about what's loving, is it loving to kill someone? No, nope. commandments say no, nope. no, nope. not loving to kill someone. The rule of God is a life of forgiveness and restoration. We've already talked about this, receiving God's grace, but also the Ten Commandments give us God's dummy's guide to love. Even the most simple person in the world can actually follow the commandments and they're not rules to stop us having fun. They are rules to help us know how to love. How do I love you? Probably by not killing you. That's a good start. And that means that not only do I not kill you, but I don't hurt you. As Jesus says, even if you punch someone, you've already started to go down that path. And not only do I not do something, but I make your health and your life my concern. Every one of these commandments is protecting something good about our brother and sister. And every one of them is telling us, okay, you can't mess with life and health. You can't mess with someone's sexual integrity. You can't treat them as objects to be used. You need to uphold it. And you should not commit adultery is not just avoid talking to women. No, they're bad. That's, that's not going to cut it. What it means is marriage is sacred. Your personal integrity is sacred. This is a wonderful gift that we have to give, and it should be given in all the love of God, either through giving ourselves completely to God in a celibate life or giving ourselves completely over to God in a married life. This is a sacred gift, and it's a positive thing, not a negative. We can't steal from each other. We can't slander each other because these things, our good name, the truth, are sacred to God. And think about the coveting at the end of the commandments. Coveting is almost the worst. Coveting what you have poisons me. If I covet, let's say I'm really, really jealous of Marcy. I think I just... I. I can't grow a moustache like him. I must, I must have one. If I covet this, then I am not capable of being grateful to God for what God has given me. I lose even what God has given me. 
the opposite of coveting is gratitude and also joy at what God has given everyone else. Praise God. I mean, this is striking, stretching a bit, but praise God for the mustache. Hooray. <laughs> and praise God for what he has also given me. All of these commandments protect our joy. They protect our joy and our love. They protect us from hating our neighbor, hurting our neighbor. They protect us from even being misguided and misunderstanding. There's lots of people who will tell us in Australia very soon that it's more loving to kill people who are sad and sick and sorrowed. They're pushing euthanasia laws like anything else. And the commandments remind us that no matter how we feel or how they feel, it's never loving to kill someone, to take their life. It's always loving to give them dignity and care and peace as much as we possibly can, but it's never loving to do that. The constant call to work for the kingdom of God is to share in the joy of God's love. And I want to focus on that word joy and bring others home. One of the things that will either make or break our mission is joy. If you go to the altar rail and receive the King of Kings and Lord of Lords on your tongue, the most majestic and beautiful gift anyone can give you, and you walk back looking like you've sucked a lemon, no one's going to believe you. If you have received God's love, if you've been forgiven, if you've been released from the shackles of sin and you know where you can go to get unshackled every day and you know God's grace is coming to you every day and all we can do is whinge and moan and, and be mean to people, no one's going to find that convincing. If we can find joy in God's love and God's plan, even when other people would find it hard to be joyful, that speaks of God's love. If we can rejoice in the privilege of loving people, even when they persecute us, that's what Christ did. And that's what speaks of God's love. God's kingdom is shaking the whole world with love, changing their expectations with love, changing our whole perception of what's supposed to happen by love. Most people that I speak to, especially young people in Australia have stopped believing it's possible to love and be loved. They kind of have this very cynical idea of getting as much as you can kind of doing enough to get away with it, but not much else. We need to bring God's kingdom with that kind of thing. So, as I promised, the questions that I asked halfway through, I'm going to ask again. With Christ as our king, with Jesus as true God and true man, this Jesus Christ says, follow me. What does this mean? What does it mean for today? When I get up tomorrow, what does it mean when I look at my past? Now that I did that deliberately, when I look at my past, I almost always, because I'm a melancholic, I almost always kick myself. Go, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I could change the past. Well, Christ has changed the past. He's taken it on himself and he's taken it to the cross. I don't have to bear that burden anymore. When I look at the past, I can see Christ. When I plan for the future, I can see Christ. If Christ is the king, where do I, his follower, fit in his kingdom? And that's where I'm leaving it today. Over to you, Marcy. Thank you very much. And uh, let's give Peter a big hand for uh, a very enlightening. I have uh, posted uh, a question here, Peter, if you can read that. Jesus said he is God and the Father and him are one. But during the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is praying, not my will, but yours be done. And there are several verses in the Bible asking the Father's will. 
how do we understand this in the light of what the scripture is teaching? Um, very good question. And to answer it properly and fully, I would need to be a, a scholar of Christology, as in a <laughs> study of Christology. And so I, I can almost hear Mariusz, uh, our Polish uh, theologian at the university, now telling me off because I don't know the answer. But in, in the scriptures, it's very clear that Jesus is a distinct person because we say there are three persons and one God, right? Mm -hmm. And they are in relationship with each other. One is Father, one is Son, and one is Holy Spirit. So they are all the same God. They are all one, but it's not as if they are exactly the same um, thing and they just look, look like three different things to us. It's not like that. They are three distinct persons and their whole um, being is to love each other for starters. Uh, so Thomas Aquinas says, God is pure act. That is his pure love because what he is, is the love between the three persons. Now in order to love, they need to be distinct. Um, I love my wife because she is other to me. She's out, you know, she's another person to me. Um, so, in the scriptures, all we see is a kind of examples of the fact that Jesus and the Father love each other and they are distinct from each other. Not, not, you know, not two gods, but they are distinct persons from each other. Now, Jesus, I could even go further than this and push it a little harder if we want to get more um, mind-blowing and say, at one stage, Jesus says, I don't even know when the end's coming. Only God knows that. He says, I don't know when the, you know, the last day is. God knows that. That's his choice. Now, a Christol someone who studies Christology will probably tell me at that point, what we're talking about here is the human, the human limited limitations of the, the person Christ. Um, don't forget that in the Gospels, Jesus grows in knowledge and grace. As a, when he's a child, he grows up. Now, how can he possibly get more knowledge than he ever had since he's God? Because he has quite, in taking on human form, we often misunderstand, taking on human form, he, part of the, the hugest part of this is the whole universe is not big enough to contain God, and yet he's contained in a baby. And so um, part of the explanation is that Jesus has limited himself in human form. Uh, at this point now what i would like to say though is that jesus is leading us to be sons of god and how do we be sons of god we trust the father mm. and he's saying to us he i mean his prayer in the garden is the perfect prayer before suffering not my will notice before that though he did ask uh could i get away from this suffering <laughs> i'd like to not suffer <laughs> that's okay to pray that way too but he submits himself to the father. Um, if you really want to blow your mind, think about uh, his prayer. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, how does that fit between the persons of the Trinity? That one's a bit of a mind bender. Thank you for that. I have another question. Can you explain the church teaching on the second coming of Christ? Is it related to the fulfillment of the kingdom? Certainly in terms of the fulfillment of the kingdom, it is uh, in the sense that uh, when Christ finally judges the whole world in the second judgment, um, it'll all be over. And therefore God's complete plan will have come into fruition and we'll have a new heaven and a new earth. But what I'd like to warn against is two things. One is we should be careful not to focus too heavily on the, the sort of the end part of it that we forget to get on with doing stuff now uh -huh. that we, we don't go, Oh, well, it'll all be okay when Christ comes back and fixes everything. And Christ is just giving us a nudge saying, well, actually 2000 years ago, I started, I told them to get on with it and start doing stuff about it now <laughs> to bring the kingdom of God into the now, because in bringing the kingdom of God to now, even imperfectly, we actually, start to reveal to people God's perfect kingdom. And we, we invite people into God's perfect kingdom. So um, I strongly recommend um, 
the second coming of Christ is definitely a doctrine of the church, but you'll notice in Catholic catechisms and in Catholic teaching, you don't find the end, like the last, uh, what's the word for it? The, you know, we don't find a teaching on um, the end times. We find the four last things, oh. right? In our catechism. And what are the four last things? Does anyone know? <laughs> Death, judgment, heaven, hell. Right? So let's say the world ends in a cataclysm tomorrow and Christ comes back and judges the world, right? That's scenario one. And scenario two is I um, have a, a very quiet heart attack in my bed and I die and I, and that's the end of me. In both cases, I die I face judgment and Christ places me where in heaven or hell, whether something happens in cataclysmic events or whether it's the very end of time or whether I'm still within time actually doesn't change what I'm supposed to do now. Mm. I still have to be ready now to die. I also, and this is even more scarier. I have to be ready now to live. I have to be ready to face Christ to God and my judge tonight if I need to, but I also need to be ready to get up tomorrow and live the kingdom. And sometimes this is not, I'm not having a go at the person who wrote the question. It's an excellent question, but sometimes in my Protestant background, there were people who used a focus on the end times as a kind of a, a distraction from my role now oh, and a distraction from just live life like you you've got one day, but also plan to bring God's kingdom as if you've got your lifetime to do it. Not, that none of that changes if Christ is coming back tomorrow or whether he's coming back in a hundred years, okay. I still need to live the same way. And that's why the church doesn't focus on the end times or the, the, the second coming, it talks about the four last things, my death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Thank you for that. Um, God's kingdom is shaking the whole world with love. I love that phrase. Thank you very <laughs> much, Peter. And uh, Thank you. I Thank you for your patience, day, all of you. <laughs> I hope your day is pleasant. And, uh, you know, I, I'd love to, in behalf of all of us here, We'd like to thank you for your time and for the blessings that we're having you here today. Thank you all. And don't forget, you're all mustard seeds. You can all, the smallest thing can grow into the most magnificent fruits. Don't forget that. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. God bless. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we thank you uh, for this, uh, for this uh, time that uh, we have spent with Peter. Thank you, dear Lord, for uh, the wisdom. And thank you, Lord, Lord, for guiding us in understanding your divinity and your place in your kingdom. Uh, we, we ask you, Lord God, to protect our community, especially um, all our uh, friends from Melanesia as well, that uh, we may be protected and give us the grace, Lord God, to be able to uh, discover the Bible more and more to be discover your word and be able to share this word of yours, the word of God to all the people that we meet. All this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. Yay. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Marcy. Yep. <laughs> Un everyone yeah unmute yourselves <laughs> thank you very much thanks from manila yeah. <laughs> hello brother roger hello everyone uh, thank you peter thank you brother marcy thank you bye everyone god bless thank everyone you. good night good night night good night camera night. Good night. God camera Camera mic. <laughs> okay, first page. All right, smile. Bye. Smile, smile, smile. Who's taking the camera?
Hi. Hi. Who's taking the camera? Okay, I'll take the camera. <laughs> Okay, ready? One, two, three. Okay, page one. Page two. Okay, keep on smiling. One, two, three. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Bye, Pio. Bye. Bye, Pio from bye, bye. Solomon. Bye. Uh, Bye, Earl, you know, and your household. Bye, Tito. Bye, Tito. Bye, 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 Bye,